that the probability of having uh, civilizations of a galaxy capable of interstellar turns out to be very, very pessimistic, very unlikely. And uh, the, the, uh, obviously the number of, of possibilities are enormous, but by the time you start partitioning that in each of these segmentations in terms of how long they last and which ones have planets and which planets are capable of supporting life, you, go, you start cutting through that, you discover very quickly, just to take one example, for example, if you have these planets, the planets with life, is very, very small. The, 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 uh, see, if you, if you flip this thing over and talk about what's commonly called the anthropic principle, uh, it turns out that if we try to build a mathematical model of what we know about life, it involves a number of parameters that are astonishingly sensitive. Um, there are just literally hundreds of these ratios, and if they are changed by one part in 15 million, life is impossible. So you suddenly begin to realize that as you start profiling the peculiar circumstances that make life as we know it possible, it becomes uh, increasingly absurd, um, not only in terms of its origin, but even in terms of its maintenance. Uh, to give you an example, you know, you hear all these ozone people saying, you know, if you have one-tenth of one percent difference in the ozone, somehow it's cosmic doom. Well, okay, who balanced it in the first place, and more importantly, why does it stay unbalanced? And so you begin to realize that the, just applying the anthropic principle alone, which is only one of these seven parameters, obviously, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, you end up, if you're honest about the parameters, you end up with probabilities that are so absurd that it, uh, you really have to come out with the idea that it's unlikely. It's actually what we're discovering is that life as we see it here is a miracle. It's not something that has a probabilistic uh, uh, likelihood of happening. It's just the mm -hmm. opposite. And so uh, the, the Drake formula was really intended to serve the SETI people, but it also turns out, in effect, to be a, in, an interesting mathematical way of demonstrating how uh, absurdly unlikely uh, 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 one can expect interstellar communication. Now, that all, all of that is, of course, based on our common uh, physics, our common uh, understanding mm -hmm. of science. It ignores the fact that uh, the reality that we're dealing with is but a subset of a larger reality. There's a very interesting article in the, in the June issue, 2005, of Scientific American, where the article dealt with the constancy of constants. And what it dealt with was the fact that they're beginning to discover that the constants of physics themselves seem to be changing. They're, they're very intensely studying that. But the point they make, which is, I think, extremely provocative, is that if the constants are indeed changing, as apparently they are, um, that implies that our physical reality is but a shadow of a larger reality. That's their words, not mine. And uh, we, we also see that confirmed here just in the last few weeks with the GEO 600 experiments going on in Germany. Mm -hmm. There they're trying to measure gravity waves and they encounter a certain kind of noise and they've now uh, uh, suspect, it's, it, it not, it's not conclusive, but they suspect that what they're encountering in that noise is the granularity in effect, what I'd call a granularity, that the whole universe is but a hologram. And yeah. these kinds of concepts are at the very frontiers of science, whether you call it the information sciences or whether you call it the physics, whatever. The point is, we're beginning to realize that what we think of as the physical reality has a boundary. There's a boundary to our reality, and we're realizing that our reality is but a subset of some kind of a larger existence. Well, what makes that so interesting, it really is impossible to discuss these kinds of things competently without dealing with the reality that we're dealing with theological issues, not just physics issues. And so as we move into this topic here about extraterrestrial intelligence, uh, if you're confining your horizon to what we think of astrophysics, fine. But what we're really dealing with here is the likelihood that if we do encounter interstellar communication, uh, we need to recognize the possibility of demonic activity. Mm -hmm. And that gets into a realm that most scientists don't want to talk about, and yet at the same time is a, 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 via, a, a very valid area for a serious um, a empirically based inquiry uh, to the existence of, of the whole concept of demonology. Are these and what creatures I, real and, and, and so forth? And that gets to the whole UFO thing because the basic contradiction that we're facing as we talk about the UFOs is on the one hand uh, they, uh, they leave physical evidence behind 
uh, ra radiation burning, so forth. Uh, they also show up on multiple radars simultaneously, and radars don't have hallucinations on the one hand. On the other hand, they violate physical laws. They go faster than the speed of sound without sonic booms. They make right-angle turns at absurd speeds. Uh, they, 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 they're, so the point is uh, uh, that area is incredibly difficult to research because of all the foolishness that floats around, and also the, de the, the deliberate disinformation that's introduced into the, into the picture. And yet, at the same time, uh, uh, serious researchers who get into this, and I'll use Jacques Vallée, the Frenchman, and also J. Allen Hynek, the American, who are probably the two most respected researchers in this background, both of them came to the conclusion that these things are demonic and they're hyperdimensional, not intergalactic. And, right. uh, and, uh, and both of those conclusions by them, I think, has continued to be validated by people who seriously research this area. So I'm prattling off in an area I didn't mean to... To, to, you know, all this derives from the green, the, you know, the green bank form, the, the so-called uh, Drake formula, as, as as a as a profile against which to map what we think we know. Well, and actually, you're you're only going really where I want to go with this whole issue. And what I would want people to know is if they if they went to uh, read your bio, I think your bio might be on your website somewhere. They would find out that you're qualified to speak at, uh, on this issue from both the. Uh, scientific and also the theological, uh, which is very obvious just in hearing you speak. What's interesting is I was writing down holographic universe right while you were talking, and then you brought it up. And you've, now you've got my mind on fire. I want to talk to you about things that don't have anything to do with this interview, including CERN, <laughs> the CERN, what I call the CERN Stargate. You know, we've got this Hindu god over there getting ready to do a, the, the, the dance that might you know, open uh, more than finding the God particle. I mean, there could be matter manipulating forces in there that we don't understand yet. In fact, even one of their own physicists, you might have saw that a few weeks ago, where he said we could actually bring something through or we could send something through. Um, but now, when, you, when you're talking about the subject of demons, though, this raises another question. I want to get your input on recent Vatican astronomer comments, like those that have been made by Father Jose Gabriel uh, Funes, those that were made before him by Guy Cosmonalgo, uh, Father Malachi Martin many years ago, uh, Geraldo Balducci. There's been a series of these astronomers with the Vatican, and each of them almost seem to be saying the same thing. In fact, Guy Cosmonalgo might have slipped about where he's going with his next book when he referred to it as a study into the so-called, quote, Jesus seed, which sounded very much like he was talking about panspermia, uh, but I'll wait and see when his book comes out. But, it, but, it, but in every case so far, most of these Vatican spokesmen are speaking of this in very positive language. If we are faced with uh, this, uh, you know, with suddenly a superior intelligence to our own, and some of them are saying it's more likely now than not that we are going to be faced with it, but it won't challenge the authority of the Catholic Church. What's going on <laughs> inside the Vatican? Well, I can only presume, uh, I, I'm cynical enough to, uh, to uh, color what I hear from them in terms of power and, and, and uh, a balance of power. Uh, the, fact, the way the Vatican has embraced Islam is an example. Many people don't realize what's going on there, but in fact, it's very, very shrewd global politics, uh, in, in, my, in my opinion. And so as I see them positioning some of these conversations having to do with things like evolution, now here, there, let me use that as an example. The evolutionary hypothesis is clearly disprovable mathematically, and, 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 and most, there are a number of serious, a large number, a growing number, of serious scientists which acknowledge that the evolution no longer is a rational explanation for what we, what we presently know about our universe. But uh, nevertheless, it's still taught in our schools, and it still is a foundational aspect to our whole culture. And for the Vatican to embrace that as they have in the past is, on the one hand, shocking. On the other hand, it's probably very shrewd politics. And so as I, uh, I watch them position their comments vis-a-vis -vis astrophysics and or, uh, you know, uh, uh, biological origins, that sort of thing, uh, I, see the, I, I tend to, to, to see the same forces at work, that you're dealing here with incredibly significant uh, political uh, uh, waves of power, uh, you know, they have implications that are, uh, go far beyond just, the, you know, a rational dialogue of fundamentals here. It's, you're dealing with the major power structures, and, and, and I think no one understands those things better uh, than the Vatican because of its whole history. So I, I, I tend to, you know, I, I, I tend to see those things colored uh, by their uh, political implications.